Thank you very much, and welcome into this next edition of the Roundtable. Bill Priestley, Thomas Watson here with you. And ever since this segment got started, this is the one roundtable that I've really actually wanted to have ever since we got started. Because way back when, we heard this harrowing number, 80,000 drivers. We're short. we got to get new drivers. we got to get people into the system. And these are exactly the two people that I want to talk with as well. We've got Jeremy Raymer, uh, of course, our host of Taking the Higher Road and CEO of Driver Reach, and then also Leah Shaver from the uh, National Transportation Institute, president of that organization. Thank you both for joining us. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So 80,000 uh, drivers, that was the number that was mentioned a while back, and uh, we looked like we needed to be recruiting, 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 recruiting. Uh, and now we've got we've heard reports the last three months, 10,000 plus jobs per month are coming back. Your reaction to what's happening in the industry? Jeremy, I'll start Still with you. Still a ton of demand for drivers. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy, go ahead. I think the demand for drivers is, is still strong. It always has been strong. Uh, certainly, we've seen things slow down a, a little bit, you know, here in the last few months. But that being said, um, we've this the underlying current hasn't changed in, I mean, close to 20 years that I've been in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, totally. As I started to say, probably overlapping with him that there's still a huge demand for drivers and uh, what we refer to as perpetual driver supply constraints really haven't changed. We we need younger people entering the industry. We have older folks that are exiting. Uh, we're still training a lot of people and we still have, for the most part, a huge demand for drivers that have two years or more experience at most carriers. So um, the bottom line is I, I, I don't think that number has changed too much. Okay. So as we move in, uh, unrelated to that necessarily that story necessarily perhaps, or at least on paper, uh, we've heard reports in the last uh, week or so about um, owner operators uh, transferring to the corporate sector and picking up some of those jobs. Uh, your, first off, your reaction to that, Leah, we'll start with you uh, in terms of that, trying to curtail that as from, as from a massive corporate uh, perspective. Yeah, you know, um, companies midsize and up are still very heavily relying on contract freight business. And, and for the most part, that type of business is allotted to corporate entities, not so much the small individual motor carrier. So uh, if if we've got individual motor carriers that entered the industry as a as a business owner in a low barrier entry point like the last couple of years and they're now looking for some safe haven as we're referring to it they're having uh, some challenges managing their expenses and uh, and dealing with spot rates that have drastically declined for them um, they're they're certainly seeking those opportunities to lease on to a carrier but for the most part Motor carriers are are generally looking to have employee drivers that are operating in those in those um, contract business arrangements, and um, opportunities for owner operators can be somewhat limited. So, um, between qualifications, the actual truck, and and getting that operating, um, there's certainly you know this this move back and forth and. Uh, and we've been advising carriers, if you're interested in owner operators, to step up your game right now to make sure it's clear what opportunities you have for them because they are looking for a, a safe spot to run. Yeah, Jeremy, your reaction to that as well? Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I think, you know, the opportunity in, the, in America, the opportunity to, to be an entrepreneur and own your own business is, is enticing. And certainly the last few years, uh, that has been the case in, in the trucking industry with spot rates being as high as they were. But as, the, as that has deteriorated, I think it, the, the reality sets in and the challenges that, that, uh, that running your own business entails. So I think to Leah's point, you know, opportunities that may exist with fleets that have contract freight. Is a, is a better place to be. And certainly uh, leveraging the independent contractor opportunities for, for fleets is a, is, a, is a great way to, to grow. 
I think depending upon the size of the carrier as well, owner operators can be attractive. Smaller carriers, from my experience, you don't really want to bring in too many owner operators because in my, from my startup days, we brought in a few, but their trucks kept breaking. And then also you have to deal with the fact that they want to haul certain things. They want certain weights. They add all these constraints and difficulties and baggage involved. With a mega carrier with 5,000 trucks, you're looking at your mix, like you said. I need to bring in experienced drivers, but do I want to have too many owner operators that have agency in a forced dispatch environment? Or do I want to continue to try and make them either lease purchase or bring in new drivers from the fold and manage those levels because like you said it's about filling the bucket yeah um, so now as we start to see this influx of drivers come in in terms of, of, of either owner operators or new drivers into the market uh, and these numbers are, are not small again we're talking 10,000 drivers a month are you still concerned about uh, recruiting or are you maybe moving a little bit more towards um, uh, retention and keeping those drivers within the flock within, within an industry that obviously has a high turnover rate. Yeah, I don't think that's a shift, actually. I think that folks have been very focused for the last two years on retaining the drivers that they have, on, on making sure that their, their packages are elevated to the max that they can afford to offer. And um, more, almost more importantly, that the culture and the, and the company uh, feel for each driver has something that, that meets their individual needs. Whatever it is you're looking for, we've got it. I, I don't think that there's going to be a shift in that perspective. In fact, I think it might even increase in, in a time when, um, when we still have an aging workforce where, you know, as I mentioned before, we still have a, a big demand and desire for drivers that have experience. And so uh, they'll still, they'll continue to amp up their retention efforts while maybe um, uh, moderating some of the recruiting uh uh, campaigns, challenges to increase pay and other offerings uh, uh, way ahead of typical standards. That's that's one thing that we've experienced in high numbers in the last two years. And um, this doesn't mean that, that pay and package offerings aren't important. It just means that they take a little lesser uh, effort that they have in the last couple of years. Jeremy? Yeah, to add to that, you know, I remember back in 2008 and 2009, I don't think we're anywhere near that or approaching anywhere near that, but that was really tough. You know, right up to that point, though, we were talking about driver shortage for years. And, uh, uh, you know, once we got through that period of time, you know, this is the Great Recession, you know, that talk about driver shortage completely disappeared. The opportunity that presented itself, however, was an opportunity to upgrade or top grade your current, you know, the, your personnel, you know, whether it's drivers or whoever. And I think certainly when things slow down, if things slow down further than they are you know, today, there may be an opportunity to improve maybe some of your underperforming uh, folks that you've got on staff. But that being said, uh, the demand for drivers still you know, continues to remain uh, strong, certainly strong enough. What you can probably do is not have to spend as much or focus as much on recruiting. Certainly take care of the ones you've got, as I would expect to see uh, turnover uh, drop you know, fairly significantly if things continue to, uh, to, to maintain the same trajectory we're starting to see the last few months. Looking at strategies right now, we talked a bit a little bit earlier about how recruiting drivers with two or more years of experience, which can be a little bit more difficult sometimes because of baggages and making sure they meet it. With the economy and everything getting tighter right now, mega carriers normally bring in people straight out of CDL school. Is there a significant change in strategies to where now I need I can target more experienced drivers, or do I still need to continue bringing people straight into the industry and hope they make it through the first six month churn? Well. First of all, we always recommend a diversified recruiting strategy. You don't want to completely close one pipeline in in effort um, to recruit the next, and then find yourself, uh, you know, imbalanced at, a, at an inopportune time. But that said, um, there's there any time there's a shift in capacity, absolutely, carriers generally speaking have a preference to a more experienced driver, and uh, much like not needing to spend so much um, to attract drivers, they're, they're absolutely going to choose the best qualified of candidates in front of them. And, and when it comes to qualifications, they may be very attracted to a, a highly experienced driver versus a new entrant. Yeah, Jeremy? 
you know, I think an opportunity, you know, carriers, the opportunity to hire drivers that uh, have two plus years experience probably will it'd be a lot easier going forward, assuming that we maintain the same trajectory that we're on. So from that perspective, I think to Leah's point, having that, uh, maintaining that balance really important. As you look at the quality of the applicants that is starting to come in, and you're, like I say, if you're trying to go after someone with two plus years experience uh, or more, it seems like also that there may be uh, certain frameworks where that that uh, pool of applicants, <clears throat> excuse me, could be quite restricted, uh, especially in view of what the FMCSA is talking about, new regulations uh, with the, in the uh, confirmation hearings. Uh, Hutchison talked, or Robin Hutchison talked about um, hair follicle uh, drug testing. Are you worried, perhaps, or do you, does this give? carriers more of a chance to be a little bit more picky or restrictive depending on the applicant pool as these regulations may or may not come to fruition. Jeremy? I'll touch on that first. Um, you know, with the clearinghouse that exists today, you know, we've we've already seen 90 plus thousand drivers eliminated from the pool. I mean, that's a significant number, but that's that's what we want. That's what it was intended to do. It was intended to get drivers who are who are not safe off the highways and so from that perspective we certainly want to continue down the path uh, from a from a highway safety standpoint we want safe drivers on the roads but that is going to reduce the numbers that you have out there and so we certainly need uh need to replace those i don't i would not suspect um well i'll say this when it comes to hair follicle testing i know that the the positive rate is is considerably higher three four five times higher than, the, uh, than what your analysis uh, reveals. And so I would expect that number to increase significantly if that becomes a regulation that uh, in effect, there are companies doing that already today. And as a result, they're you know, not hiring drivers if they detect uh, you know, from a hair follicle uh, positive test. But unfortunately that is not uh, able to be reported to the, to the clearinghouse. And so that driver can go get another job somewhere else. Um, so it certainly has the potential if that becomes a, able to be reported to the clearinghouse, it has the potential to reduce that pool significantly, assuming there are a lot of users out there that are going undetected. But we're getting a lot of new en entrants into the industry, at least certainly a lot of interest. And I think the opportunity that will reveal itself with the uh, uh, apprenticeship program, you know, thousands of drivers, 18 to 20 year old, you know, going through that program over the course of the next few years, I think we'll start to see if that becomes uh, in a, a law and we reduce that minimum age to 18, We'll have a great opportunity to have a nice pipeline every year of high school graduates that uh, make their way into the trucking industry. And I think that'll be a, a net net major positive. Leah? I would just add that um, that uh, being able to hire younger folks as they enter the industry, ideally, we're also capturing them before they're 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 using, um, you know, marijuana, for example, if it's in a in a state that it's already legal, uh, we're able to to attract them and and let them know that this is an industry where that's not OK. Um, I think that uh, hair follicle testing, much like the clearinghouse, simply allows for a greater amount of self-selecting out of the industry. And so um, today we see many new entrants that that want to know what carrier doesn't do hair follicle testing. Um, they are already self-selecting out and choosing carriers that, that only do uh, your analysis. Um, that will simply increase in numbers and having to rely on those newer entrants that Jeremy mentioned on folks that are um, safe and, and choosing to be clean operators. Those, those are uh, simply going to keep our, our funnel narrow and, um, and ideally having the safest and, and best drivers that are operating in the industry. We've got about uh, 15 seconds left. Let me ask you very quickly, if I gave each one of you $100,000, how much of it is going to recruiting and how much of it is going to retention? Leah? Uh, for me, it'd probably be 85% to retention because when people say, I want the um, highest qualified drivers, I tell them you already have them. They're operating in your truck today. Jeremy? I was going to say the exact same thing. I was going to say 80-20, so I'm surprised that, uh, or not surprised actually, that Leah uh, shared the same sentiment. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. And it's good, obviously, it's good to see that more people are in the industry, uh, but obviously, we want to see more, and obviously, we want to see them stay there as well. Thank you both for joining us.
right, we'll take a break and we'll come back and wrap up the show after this.